All right, Rooster, are you ready? For what? Test drive at 69 Hemi Charger. I already got it warmed up. Listen to that little bad boy there. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Not bad, not bad. Got a little bit of a miss, but it's an unrestored old car. Boy, that clutch rides high. There's nothing left of that. No clutch? clutch. Not much left. You gonna try to hurt my neck? I'm not gonna hurt anybody. I just wanted to drive a car that we can actually drive. Listen to that old thing. It's kind of nice old car. Look at that plate. Hey, what wheel. are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> They're coming to get you, Barbara. Very deep in the Pacific Northwest. One team in Springfield, Oregon, takes on the impossible. Finding dead Mopar muscle and bringing it back from the grave. Award-winning master of Mopar, Mark Warman. His cousin, Doug. His daughter, Alyssa. His best friend, Royal. His painter, Will. His assembly tech, Justin. And the rest of the GYC ghouls are restoring, resurrecting, and recreating some of the fastest fiercest and rarest muscle cars on the planet. This is Graveyard Cars. We just brought in two 1969 Dodge Charger RT 426 Hemi four-speed cars. Two of them. We already had the third one that's in process right now. That is some pretty rare demographics all to be at one place. Now, the two cars that just came in, a green one, which was a basket case and in bad shape but restorable, all numbers matching, and the other one is a B3 blue, all numbers matching, running, driving car. Has all of its original drivetrain in it, and it runs and drives. Now, we don't see that very often. In fact, we very rarely see that in an original car. They're usually in pretty bad shape. But since this one did run and drive, why wouldn't I go get Cousin Dougie and take it out for a spin? I mean, come on. Did you wax her up? Sounds all right. <laughs> no, <laughs> didn't wax her up, buddy. Is this a four-speed still? <laughs> it is. <laughs> Couldn't get the three-speed behind wow. a 440. What's wrong with you? Those are some touchy brakes. They're just brakes, buddy. They're power brakes. Well, let me brace it. Oh, oh my. That's a throw-up bearing there. It's fine, that one. Everybody knows that I've known Dougie my entire life. So I'm 59, Dougie's 60 years old. We've been riding around in cars together since I was 15 and he was 16. Nothing's changed. He's still a lunatic, right? He still way overreacts, way overreacts to everything on the road, talks insanity, so you have no idea what he's talking about or how to follow it along. You just know it means something to him. Green Had a green alligator skin top. Okay. Is that what you call it? No. No? <laughs> no, they didn't have that. And besides that, the one constant with Dougie is he's unhinged. Generally speaking, unhinged. That old thing runs out pretty good. Third gear, huh? Third gear, third gear. I love going on a road test in these old cars. It brings back a ton of memories for me. What are we going to have for lunch today? What are we going to have for lunch today? Yeah. A&W. A&W's been closed since 1980. Yeah, but I still like root beer floats. Mark and I spent a ton of time in our Mopars back in the day, and one thing is still the same. We love food. So, if you couldn't have A&W because they've been closed for 40 years, what would you have? Chocolate brownie thunder ice cream. You can't have chocolate brownie thunder for lunch. Now, this is true. Dougie and I do love to eat. We always have. The difference between us is that I live here in the present, 2022, and I eat a lot more responsibly than I did when I was 15 years old. Dougie's still living in a time that may or may not have ever existed and eating food that would not be on anybody's nutritional diet guide. I'm not eating ice cream for lunch. I had it after dinner. It's called dessert. It's not a main course. Oh, look, my favorite ice cream. Go oh, hot. Well, this runs good, doesn't it? It doesn't run bad. It doesn't run and drive bad for a car that's had nothing done to it with 70,000 original miles. When you were talking about today's collectible cars, second generation Charger, 68 to 70, right now, that's number one. It's even beating out the Kudas. That's right. When you add in 426 Hemi in a four-speed, 
you're talking about an amazingly rare car that to see it like this, this car runs and drives beautiful. This car runs and drives and shifts through the gears and feels like the cars did when I was a kid, not the freshly restored ones that are much tighter. This drives just like a car that you pulled out of a garage in 1980 and went for a drive in. And it's very cool to be able to ride around with Doug and, and go through all of the mechanisms on the car that we totally don't expect to work, but do. Ooh. Reverse light right there working all nice, look at that. Yeah. Turn signals, have L31s. Oh, the L31's missing over there. Hey, there are no L31s. There is over here. That one's missing. I just said that. Well, I can't see it. Oh, welcome to 30 seconds ago. How can I see yours and I'm shorter than you and you can't see mine? I don't know what's wrong with Dougie. I don't know. It's cognitive stuff. I can deal with other things. Bad taste in cars, I don't know how to insult you. But what do you do about a guy that has no idea? He's in Looney Land, right? Hey, look where we're at, the Motor View Drive-In Theater. The old Motor View, yeah. yeah. Hasn't been there for a couple of decades or so. What do you think uh, they're playing tonight? Hey, you know what's? The Motor View Drive-In isn't there, neither is the A&W that was down there. So hi, welcome to 40 years ago. I don't like it already. Yes, I know the difference between yesterday and today, but can't I still pretend? Is that a crime? Thing. It's kind of a nice old car. Look at that plane. Hey, what wheel. are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I almost got a whole turn out of that. You're darn right I'm scared when I ride with Mark. He's nuts. He used to speed down South 4th Street with me on the back of his Honda 100 with barely any brakes. He spun his 68 Impala around in a circle on Main Street. That You're driving like a Crandall. Sir? What? I do not drive like a Crandall. We should, we should go see the Crandalls. Yes, we should. Let's go drive over and see the Crandalls, see what they're doing today. Let's go see Lola. L-O-L-A, Lola? Uh -huh. This 1969 Dodge Charger RT was built with a 426 Hemi and a four-speed manual transmission. It's only one of 207 ever built. It also happens to be the subject of this week's autopsy report. So let's have a look at the fender tag. So remember, when you're reading a fender tag, you need to start on the bottom left-hand corner, and it reads left to right, bottom to top. So with this fender tag, it starts out with an E74. What that's gonna mean is it's a 426 Hemi. D21 means it was built with a heavy-duty four-speed manual transmission. XS29 means that it's a Dodge Charger RT. So J9G. J means it's a 426 Hemi. The nine stands for the model year, so in this case, it's 1969. And the G is gonna stand for the fact that it was built in St. Louis, Missouri. The 166686 is gonna be the serial number. Up on our next line, we have B3. That's gonna be the exterior color, and in this case, it stands for light blue metallic. B3, that's gonna be the interior color. That means that on this car, it's the same as the exterior, which means it's light blue too. C6D. C stands for charger seats, 6 stands for vinyl bucket, and D stands for dark blue. B13. That's going to be the build date. In this case, November 13th, 1969. 087972 is going to be the vehicle order number. It's also only on the build sheet. A33. That's going to mean track pack with a 354 Dana 60. C55, bucket seats. J25, three speed wipers. L31, turn signal indicators. M21, drip rail moldings. M31, body belt moldings. N85, tick tock tachometer. R11, AM radio. V8W, white bumblebee stripe. 26, 26 inch radiator, which came mandatory with any A33 car. End, an end of sales code. The 1969 Barracuda is the best car of its kind on the highway. 
for action, real sports car spirit, and style that's unsurpassed. Barracuda beats them all. Get a load of the options you can use to make your car your car. Like an optional vinyl roof, for instance, in four different colors. Available this year on the Fastback, as well as the hardtop. New cast aluminum center road wheels help give sports car action. New styling features on the front end and on the rear. So a couple years ago, Mark brought in this 1970 Cuda that's a 440 six barrel four speed car. It was a really nice car when it got here, but it was still in need of a restoration. If you remember, this is the car that Mark took that 1969 Charger in to go towards the cost of the restoration. I have no idea what Will's talking about when he says the guy traded in a 69 Charger towards the restoration on this. The guy that traded in the 69 Charger traded it for a 70 Roadrunner, 446 barrel four-speed car. He used that as equity towards the restoration. This guy traded in two Cudas or Barracudas. If you go back and watch the footage, we were able to drive all three cars at the same time. It finally has gotten through the shop and we're time for final paint. We're doing a base coat, clear coat. It's EF8 Ivy Green. I've done this color twice now since. I've done it on an E body and a B body. I prefer it on the E body and it's, it's different. Exciting day. We got our 1970 Cuda in here. Do you know why it's a 70? The difference between a 70 and a 71? Nope. You've been here for 10 years. I wish I was here for 10 years. So what I've been doing with Brody is throwing a lot at him in a very small window. And the 71 has those little louvers in the fenders that I don't like. Okay. 70 is my favorite. This is going FE8. It's a dark green, super metallic, super transparent. Kind of a hard color. That's why I had you spend so much extra time prepping this. Which you actually did a good job. The whole car looks great. I'm going to seal the whole entire car, which will cover the breakthroughs and give us a nice, even starting point for the color to go on this car. Okay. It's gotta be prepped just right. You know, so Brody and I went over this car with 600, made sure we had no chance of sand scratches. And just to be sh ensure that we're not gonna get those, I did a nice coat of sealer over it. It's really great that my dad's taking the time to show me things like this. I know he's explained this before, but to see it firsthand definitely helps. Now I understand why some cars get finished off in 400 and why some get finished off in 600. I let that sealer dry for about 45 minutes, and then I go back in and just walk around the car to make sure nothing's missed. So we're heading over to Glenwood, folks. That's where uh, Dougie grew up. I unfortunately ended up there hanging out. Worst thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> Coming up with an idea for a TV show called Fast Times at Glenwood High. Never went there. There is no Glenwood High. I made that up. It, it's an imaginary place. He should know that. He grew up over there. But everything in his head's imaginary. Oh, take a left here on Henderson. Henderson connects Franklin Boulevard to East 17th Street, where I used to live. Here we are. Look at this. Boy, it's changed over here, though, a lot. Yeah. I don't even, does the train still go through here? Sure don't look like it, does it? Pretty quiet. One constant as you get older that you recognize is everything changes. It's sad. It's sad when you go back to a town and you're so used to seeing the old Eugene drive-in or maybe it was the A&W like Doug talked about or the Motor View drive-in or the old roller skating rink. They're all gone. Huh. We'll go up here on Judkins Point. Oh, love Judkins Point. That's where Jerry got beat up. He did? Yeah. Jerry got tricked by his girlfriend and got beat up up there, yep. When we were driving down Henderson Boulevard, it reminded me of when Doug, he saw a 68 Charger that he wanted and apparently his mommy and daddy wouldn't buy it for him. So he concocted this idea that if I ass in the car and total it, and I know I don't have insurance, that my stepdad Harold will bail me out. And the fact is you need to see it in real life to believe that story. I'll just leave it at that. Mark will not let go of the story about how I got my charger. It was an accident. I did not plan it. Sure, I got my charger out of the deal, but that doesn't mean it was intentional. We actually stopped at the same railroad crossing so Mark could torture me some more about it.
You know, like I say, not to get all reminiscent, but when mom was sick there and I would go and visit her every day, didn't want to talk about anything current. She wanted to talk about the past. We wanted to talk about when we were kids and how I would come home and say, hey, mom, I'm home. And it was just, she loved the times of us as a young family. I couldn't understand, why can't we talk about like something now? Like Braveheart Carter's doing really good. Let's talk about that. Didn't want to, because those were the best times in her life. As I get older and as I'm exposed to that stuff, I realize the exact same thing. A lot of the stuff that we're talking about are the best times in our life. We did it, Rooster. We did it. We did it. Back in time. Tour de Glenwood. Back in time. Finished. F-I-N-I-S. Finished. Oh. Fini. No? No. Fini. That's French. The 1969 Barracuda can give you all the power you want to handle. The Standard 6 has 145 horsepower to get you where you want to go. And the Standard 8 is 230 horses worth of action. And if that's not enough power for you, the Formula S is one of the packages that gives you quick acceleration, firm ride and handling, and a groovy sports car appearance. So I had mentioned that we just brought in two 69 Hemi Chargers. The other one is a green car. It is a numbers matching engine, transmission, original rear end under the car. All the body numbers match, but it's pretty rough. It, it's much a basket case than anything else. It also has quite a bit of rust on it. But it is a good, complete car, and it's going to be just an incredible car when it's finished. My client just bought that car. And it's very important that when you buy a car that's supposed to be numbers matching, we check the numbers and we can tell that it is numbers matching. But what happens when you take that block and you send it to the machine shop and have it checked out and they come back and say, it's not repairable, it's internally cracked. There's a process called magnafluxing and pressure testing. And we wanted to get that engine out right away, disassembled over to the machine shop so that they could get back to us and say, that motor is good, that motor is fine, we can rebuild it. And you want to do that while the deal is really fresh with the buyer and the seller. Mark wanted to get this engine out and taken apart so he could send it out for magnafluxing and pressure testing. It was obvious that most of the engine was just bolted together and not complete. Just a little dowel dowels. Pin, little, little dowels. dowels. A little Mark Dowel pin. Yeah. Ooh. His cousin, Mark Dow, was jealous of me one time. We were ice skating over on the ponds in Glenwood. Well, mom always dressed me in dress shoes. So I could go forever. And I'm just going, going, spinning around, having a good time. He slid underneath me and knocked my legs up from underneath me. And I flew up in the air and I came down on my back and I've had problems ever since then. So. Is that what caused this? Yeah. He's dead, right? All right, take your uh, valve cover off of there. The next items to remove were the valve covers and the heads. Once that's done, we can roll the engine over and remove the crank and the pistons. Original 66 to 69 Hemi valve cover, you know how you can tell? The stovepipe right here. 70 doesn't have that stovepipe right there. It's always interesting to listen to Mark and Tony. Not too shabby. Somebody's hogged that hole out a little bit. Boy, the guy that owned this must be an old boss hog. <laughs> old boss hog himself, huh? Butchery, you call All it. All right. Huh? They know their stuff. And while I can figure things out, it's great to hear a quick way of recognizing parts. Where's the valve train at? Cleaned it out, huh? There's a lot of bad people in the world. This is supposed to be a complete engine less exhaust manifolds, carburetors, and distributor. Apparently less the entire valve train, too. Now, one of the things that was a little bit surprising was some of the guts were missing in the engine. These are kind of expensive parts to find, like the valve train assembly. Those add up. I called up the folks that my client bought it from. I said, here's the list of what's missing. We really feel we weren't being rude. We just feel those should have been in there. And they agreed 100% and gave them a full reimbursement of what those parts would cost. All right. <laughs> nice clean valve covers. That's good. These aren't too hard to come up with because they actually reproduce the 66 to 69, but nobody's done the 70s in a while. The ones that were out there are unobtainium. It's a special part. It's the worst color ever to paint. I can't emphasize that enough. 
as crazy as it sounds, this color is really dark and it's like 80% black, but it's transparent as <laughs> And it's the only color I've sprayed my whole entire life. You can't tell if you've laid it out right or not until you clear it. Now, I've talked about this before. These little movements that Will's doing, we call it posturing, okay? He is doing a preemptive strike. Oh, this is so difficult. Oh, if this isn't right. A handful of guys in the world that can do it, you know? And at the end of the day, he's just painting a car. He's just painting a car. You don't gotta make it all up to be something that isn't. Just show the guy what you're doing. Be happy with the job and don't make it something that's not. Any other color, you can tell if it's gonna be right or not before you clear it. For whatever reason, this color, no thank you. I'll let you know how I look when it's too late. You see the hat removal, the, the over dramatic hat removal, all part of the drama, right? He's in character now. This is funny to me. So when it comes to this color, very transparent color, I do five coats of color and then two drop coats to make sure the metallic is laid out properly. That usually takes me four to five hours if we haven't had any problems throughout. There were no issues on this car. After I'm done with my base coat, I'll give it a couple more hours, around 70 degrees, let it gas out completely. Then at that point, I'm ready to jump on it with a clear coat. How much does your memory serve you correctly? True or false? The vinyl top was not available on the Barracuda Fastback in 1969. Do you think you know the answer? Find out if you're correct after a quick word from our sponsors. Well, how did you do? True or false? The vinyl top was not available on the Barracuda Fastback in 1969. If you guessed true, you are wrong. If you were paying attention, you would know that the vinyl top option was available on the 1969 Barracuda in four different colors. Pay attention next time. In addition, there are 17 body colors and 24 interior trims to choose from. You can have an AM FM radio to keep up with all the latest sounds and beautiful bucket seats are standard on all models. Go ahead and pull that head off of there. Let's see, what, do you want some help? Give me the crane. <laughs> Come on. Okay. Whoa, there's pistons in there. There's no valves in there either. <laughs> dang. Gosh, dang. Those are bare heads. And none of these work. No reason to believe there will be any valves in this one, right? <laughs> OK. Whoa, look at that. And only some of them. After we got the heads off, we rolled the engine over and removed the pan. Everything looked good in there, so we went forward with the crank and rod removal. It's a lot easier to remove and install pistons with an extra set of hands. All you do is take the connecting rod cap off and then drive the piston out. Once you get a rhythm going, it goes along pretty quickly. I'm gonna start driving it right there. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. Beautiful. <sighs> gonna sneeze here pretty soon, Dougie. Oh boy, thank you for the warning. No! Oh! God. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there you go, buddy. Oh. All right. The last thing we have to do is remove the crankshaft. This is a matter of removing the crankshaft main bearings one at a time, and then we can lift the crank out. Is it break time? Gotta be. Boy, that thing is really in there. Yeah. Isn't it? Okay, with the block completely disassembled, we'll send it out to the machine shop, we'll wait to hear back from them. Main thing we're looking for again is, is the motor rebuildable? Will it hold water? Will it have oil pressure? Will it run under normal driving conditions? So as soon as I find out, you'll find out. All right, so we just finished our seventh and eighth coat. Car looks great. Now it's time to mix up our clear coat, get the whole thing cleared, and we're finally done. 
So when it comes to clear coat, I do three coats of clear. I give it approximately a half hour, depends on the temperature and whatnot. I usually keep it around 70 degrees. So by the time I get around with my first coat of clear, I'll go make up another batch of clear, give it about 10 more minutes, and then I'm ready to go back in. When I do my final coat, I give it just a little bit longer. So start to finish, when it comes to clearing a car, I'm in there for about two hours. So once I'm completely done with this car, we'll let it sit for a week or two, bring it back in, start the cut and buff process, which Noah does. Once that is all done, we'll get it washed, do the cavity wax, the rust proofing, the undercoating, all the little detail stuff, give it a good bath, good once over, make sure it's good to go, then I can get it over to assembly. Tonight's episode of Graveyard Cars features the 1973 Challenger. But here we are using the 1972 Challenger since their features are almost exactly the same. Let's dive deeper into this brilliant performer. The 72 Challenger has a new lower deck panel. Argent silver on Challenger, black on Challenger Rally. The tail lamps have improved styling. Backup lights are brighter with better lighting direction for improved night vision and safety. The console-mounted torque flight shift has a thumb-operated shift button on the handle for easy selection of any gated position. The well-arranged Challenger instrument panel, optional on the Challenger, is in simulated wood grain, fully instrumented and with warning lights for high beam and brakes. One thing I would like to say, we did just get a phone call from the machine shop and our 426 Hemi engine is saveable. There are no cracks in it, it pressure tested perfect, so now that car will maintain an original numbers matching status. And that's about as cool as it comes when you're talking about a 69 Charger with a Hemi and a four speed. So I'm really excited for today. Tony's coming out and he's gonna work with me and show me a few things on the cars that I don't know. The first car we're gonna look at together is a 1973 Challenger Rally. It's a beautiful car. I can't wait for Tony to go over it with me. I don't think we've actually restored a 73 Challenger yet, so I'm really looking forward to learning some things. Here's a Challenger, a little bit different than what you're used to seeing. What do you, what do you notice about it? So I noticed a couple different things right off the bat. The, the front end looks different. Yep, uh, it's very different really. It used to be where it was a grill and the headlight bezels were separate from the grill. And that's why they're always chrome and that you're used to probably seeing, like on Cindy's Challenger or yeah. the other 71s. But this is all part of a big fiberglass header panel that runs left to right on the front of the car. And it holds the headlights, it comes off as one big unit. And it's got what they call like the frown face grill. They are, oh, okay. Yeah, it's like a frown face. Yeah, so Mark invited me out. He had told me that we're gonna be looking at a newer Challenger, meaning like a 73 or four. So I just wanted to walk around the car with Alyssa because you know they don't really get too many of the newer cars here and let her see the differences, ask her what's different about them and I could point out some other stuff. These are the fillers. They're rubber bumper fillers, they call them. And they started using them in 73. The reason why they have them is because the bumpers are moved further away from the body for like safety impact purposes. Oh. So instead of redesigning the fenders or the whole deal, they started caring these. about safety? Yep, yep. That's, That's supposed to, I think they called them five mile an hour bumpers or something like that. Okay. But so they moved the bumpers away from the car and they just filled the gap with these rubber spacers. Tony's a great teacher. I had no idea about the five mile per hour bumpers or the rubber fillers in the bumpers. So that was pretty neat to learn about. And they're, they're supposed to be black, you said? No, they're supposed to be gray, no matter what oh, color okay. the car is. But the owner wanted them to be black, which I think was a good choice because it looks better. Yeah. Generally, the 72 to 4 Challengers aren't as cool as the 70 71 cars. They're still good cars, but back in the day, they were looked at like, you know, second class citizens. Now, 40, 50 years later, they've come into their own a little bit. Oh, that's neat. Yeah, yeah it looks good. I like it. Yeah, the hood's basically the same. The fenders are, except for the side markers. These are what I call the generic markers. See how they stick out? Mm hmm. And they use them on just about every car made from 72 up until the 80s. Use them on trucks. One of my favorite styling cues on the 70 and 71 E bodies are the flush side markers. My favorite is the Cuda. They're long and sleek, and the bezel's painted body color. The Challengers are also long and sleek, but they're chromed, which is also pretty cool. 
It was super sad to see that look go away in 1972. This emblem, it, it is a Challenger emblem, like 70s have Challenger. The emblem's a different shape in the back of it, so it fits the grill. Okay, it, oh, it, okay. The emblem 71s didn't say Challenger in the grill, it just said Dodge, because it wasn't on the hood in 71. Oh, okay. And then in 72, it went back to saying Challenger in the grill again. I don't know if you noticed, but it seemed like uh, Alyssa was a little more attentive and paying attention than I've seen her in the past. Maybe because I wasn't making fun of her or being condescending to her or giving her a hard time and I was really trying to teach more. And that's one thing I've heard from a few other people here. They really enjoy when I come out because I teach them without berating them. I don't mind working with Tony. Like, between you and me, like, it's great. He doesn't put me down. He doesn't make me feel like I'm dumb. He doesn't do his movie routines or just all the unnecessary BS that I have to go through. My dad's trying to teach me something, you know, he's just really nice. So I love working with him, it was great. I remember you said this is a rally, right? Yep. So what does that mean? 71 was the last year that they used RT, stood for road and track. 72, they rebranded it as a rally. So oh, you had okay. the Challenger rally, the Charger rally, but it was essentially the same? Yeah, it was they the just changed the name? Yep, it was the performance model. I remember my dad telling me one time, back when he started the shop in 1985, that he had a 72 Challenger, and it was yellow and black. He showed me a picture of it one time, and I thought it was a gorgeous car. He told me that he had patterned it off of the original artwork for the 1972 Challenger Rally. OK, so since they changed the RT to Rally, we're not going to see any RT emblems Correct. on this, right? That's right. OK, well, that's and something you know, else that's different. That's a good point. I never thought about this. There's no Rally emblems. Okay, so they don't there's, call it out at all? No. There's no exterior badging that says rally. It huh. just, they didn't seem proud of it. They weren't trying to promote the performance image like they were previously. That's so, interesting. Yeah. That's it weird. Is. Yeah, let, let's take a look at the side of the car. Okay. Our 72 Challenger offers three engine choices. The 225 cubic inch, leaning tower of power slant six, the 318 two-barrel, the standard for V8 models and the rally, and the optional high-end performance 344-barrel. All engines use standard fuel, and the new electronic ignition is standard with the 340 V8. And four transmissions are available. The standard three-speed manual floor-mounted, the optional column-mounted torque flight, the optional console-mounted torque flight, and the optional four-speed manual available with the 340 V8 engine only. Okay, so this was about 1978, I think. Doug's mom had a 1969 Cadillac Coupe de Ville. Dougie was bringing it back from somewhere in Eugene, and he pulled off of Franklin Boulevard onto Henderson Avenue and was heading south. He looks up ahead to where the railroad tracks are, and there's a car, a gold car, setting at the railroad tracks. Doug spots it, and he thinks, oh, gosh, I love those taillights. And he looks a little closer. Is that a 68 Charger? That's a 68 Charger. I want that car. I need that car. But my mommy and daddy won't buy me that car. And for whatever reason, the first time in his life, they said, no, you're not going to get a Charger. Meanwhile, there's a little gal in there that prior to this was sitting there reading the Bible, drinking a nice fresh glass of milk, maybe with dipping some Oreo cookies into it, waiting patiently, patiently for the train to go by. Unbeknownst to her, this maniac who decides he wants a 68 Charger, this is how he's going to get it. So he, in a twinkling of an eye, concocts the plan. I know what I'm going to do. This crap box that I'm driving has terrible brakes. Every time you hit the brakes, the brakes lock up, the car pitches sideways. Now, again, this is in one one hundredth of a second he thinks of this. He starts dropping the hammer further, dropping the hammer further. He's up to 60, 70. His eyes are getting bigger. The charger's moving in close on him. His road's on the right. He goes right past 17th Street where he's supposed to turn. He's up to 80 miles an hour, drops the hammer one last time, gets it up to 100 miles an hour, hits the binders, throws it sideways. The Cadillac's passenger door caves the entire ass end of the 68 Charger all the way up to the windshield because he knew Harold, his stepdad, will bail him out. He hits the car, slams into it, runs up to the lady. Oh, yeah, sorry, dude. I'll be right back. Meanwhile, she's dying. She's dead. I don't think she's fully dead, but she's not in good shape. Dougie takes off running with those long gazelle legs of his, takes the left on 17, runs into the house. Harold, Harold, I just totaled a car and I don't have insurance. You're going to have to buy it for me. All right, son, let's go out there and buy that car. So they wad $500 cash up somehow in that house. 
and they go running back down there. Meanwhile, the lady's bled out, so they have to give her CPR and bring her back to life. When she comes back, they say, we don't have any insurance, but we'll buy your car. I don't want to sell my car. Call ambulance. So she gets forced into a situation where she has to take the $500, and Dougie now has a 68 Charger. Yeah, they called an ambulance. The old bat was fine. That's not the point of the story. They take the Charger back. That night, they start working on it in Doug's garage. They make a couple dozer pulls. Call it good, even though the car's still three feet too short. They pack the quarter panels with mud. Bondo, filler, the stuff that I talk about that's a sin, that's what they did. Then they went over Brooks Auto Parts and spent $4 on three gallons of synthetic enamel yellow paint and painted it yellow. Painted the top black and there they were. They had a beautiful poop box 68 charger that was three feet too short, but Dougie got what he wanted. That's what it was all about. Dougie got what he wanted. The end. Let's see if you fell asleep during our earlier presentation. Which ignition system came standard on our 1972 Challenger? Electronic ignition, single point distributor, or dual point distributor? Think you know the answer? Stay tuned after this brief commercial break, and I'll let you know how you did. All right, how'd you do, folks? Which ignition came standard on our 1972 Challenger? If you guessed dual points, well, you're a year too late and wrong. The correct answer is electronic ignition. The last year Chrysler used a dual point distributor was in 1971. In addition, air conditioning is but one of the options buyers demand. It's controlled by this panel at the left of the steering wheel. Plenty of knee room, shoulder room, headroom in the back, thick carpeting throughout, rear ashtrays, and of course, seat belts for rear passengers as well as front. All right, so we have a busy day here at Graveyard Cars. Tony D'Agostino, the sandwich man, is coming out from Delaware to show me his brand new reproduction 383 and 440 HP exhaust manifolds for our B and E body cars. Now this is really cool because they nobody has made these, nobody's undertook this adventure to date. And I cannot wait because it's one of the biggest holes we've had in our parts supply chain is exhaust manifolds. If you recall, I had to steal, borrow one off of Darren's car years ago. It was the only one that was around. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's not the point. He'll be here around three or four. We'll go over those. In the meantime, I'm working with Alyssa, ordering parts too. Lots to do. So Tony's supposed to be bringing out late in the afternoon the exhaust manifolds for me to check out and visit for a couple of days, all right? I was gonna take that time and spend with Alyssa going over the 1973 Dodge Challenger, showing her all the intricate differences. While I'm explaining it to that guy right there, he chimes in that Tony's already here. I'm gonna stop what I'm doing now and I think Alyssa's out there, so I will go out there and get with her. Tony's out there with her. Never ends. What? Tony is out there with her right now, sir. Tony doesn't get here till three o'clock. Uh, sir, he's already arrived. Tony's here? Yes, sir. <laughs> What's real cool is there's strobe stripes that come out of these, and they look oh. really neat. They start off solid, then they break up, sort of like the AAR stripe, but, yeah. but a lot finer breaks in them. Oh, and, that's uh, cool. Yeah, they had them in a couple different colors, but the owner of the car wanted to go monochromatic look, so that's why he doesn't have... Kind of like the, f the bumper filler. Exactly, wanted yeah, to blend in. sleek, yep. okay. How would he get in? I, I think someone gave him a building code. Don't ever give him a building code. Anything else? Yeah, the mirrors look different. I don't know what about them is different, but... You're probably used to 70s. As I go back in my mind, I remember the conversation I had last week with Tony about this. I said, hey, I'm gonna spend some time with Alyssa on this 73 Challenger, and I was picking his brain on a couple things, but... As we were talking, he was, seemed like he was picking my brain more. Well, what would you point out on that? It's a seven, uh, that there's a 73 uh, Challenger there. Uh, uh, not, that there's not very important. And I said, well, no, you want to talk about like the frowny grill and the fiberglass. Oh yeah, that there, you could talk about that there. I didn't realize he was being a rat. He was trying to upstage a tray, man. Because they work on a lot of 70s here, mm -hmm. more so than 71s even. And the 70 mirrors are a shorter base smaller head mirror and lower. The more I sat there, and the more I ran over our conversation from the previous week, 
And the more I could kind of hear him <laughs> out here laughing and having fun, I snapped. Side winding, backstabbing, two faced, four flushing, sandwich eating mother. But still on the barracuda. See, that was one thing I wish they would have done with the, like the new Chargers, you know? Tony D'Agostino! The new Chargers have. Green. Yeah, they do, but. Right. The Hi, Chargers Tony. don't know. No, they don't. Hi, Tony. Oh, hey. hey. What's Is happening, it man? It's 4 o'clock in the afternoon already. Good to see you. Yeah. No. you got just a second. Hey, be right there. Let's. Yeah, OK, Dad. Mike Fain came in a little bit early. I come in, I look in the office, Mark's doing his thing, he's all busy. So I just came out here and, you know, it was all set up and I just let it happen. Uh, I don't know why he's upset at that. How you doing? I hope you had a good flight in. Yeah, it was okay. No, that's important that you had a good flight in. Oh, I knew what he was up to. I had no doubt about it. That's why I decided to call a little one-on-one -on -one time, a little mono e mono conversation, get to the bottom of it and prove my point. You, you were going to be here at like 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and you're here at like 9.30 in the morning. It wasn't that late, and the plane got in early. How'd the plane get in early? I've heard of planes being late, but I've never heard of one being early. The pilot sped. I was just shooting with Tony, and he came out of the office crazy, but he's always crazy, so it tracks. It's fine, and I don't know what they were talking about. I just, I just stepped back. I don't care. I have the code. To the door? Yes. Huh. And you just came in and saw the camera set up, and you thought? No, no, I looked in. You were busy in the office, and I came out here, and they were set up to go, so I just jumped right in. I was writing notes for the episode, so just you and Alyssa handling that, then you'd probably just show her some stuff. Tony and my dad have a weird relationship. They're kind of, my dad's super competitive. I mean, Tony's like the only other person in the world that knows as much as my dad about Mopars, so it's, you know, we're constantly kind of going back and forth. Yeah. On the car. Yeah. It's different than I, I know what to do. Yeah. No, I know nothing about I, being like a better dad or, or No, no, or I don't need to like have notes to go no. off. I just know it. Oh, so it is. Okay. This has nothing to do with who's the number one dad, number two dad. This is about Mopar stuff. The dad thing's Alyssa's call anyway. So. Say lovey, man. I'm in a new zen world anyway, so this stuff doesn't bother me okay. at all. I think that's great. Would you mind if I kind of just tag along, maybe uh, learn a little something, something on the 73s? I don't know him very my well. My place is your place. You're a good man. Yeah, <laughs> please, feel free to show me. I love it. Tony's saying, my place is your place? It is my place. It's graveyard cars. Don't let me so, stop. Now we're in the back of in the car. In the back, yeah. Probably lots different back here, huh? Oh, yeah. I mean, completely different. First of all, the spoiler. I didn't think they had them this late. Right. They only the really had them on the TAs, the Challenger TAs. The taillights are way different. They're putting it at an angle. That looks cool. Yeah, that's very different. That started in 72. I mean, 72 to 4 Challengers as a whole, so I definitely learned a lot today with Tony. I always love when Tony comes in town. He always brings another another side and more knowledge about the Mopars. So at the end of the day, it wasn't that bad. My takeaway from this was that there is a lot of differences between the 72 to 74 Challengers. I probably wouldn't have caught them by myself. I'm really lucky, regardless of how crazy my dad is, I'm really lucky to have two amazing mentors. All in all, it was a good day. Cool. Yeah. Well, thank you for walking around with me. That's, yeah, that's neat. Wow, they changed a lot. Yeah. Didn't know we're building custom cars now, Dad. Yeah, it's been, no, it's been educational. <laughs> Thank you, bro. Thanks, bro. Let's make sure we do dinner tonight. OK. Give me a call at half past. You know, at the end of the day, I think that's great. If Tony can come out and work with Alyssa on the 72 to 74 e-body cars, and she learns a little something, I think that's fantastic, all right? That's not the point. The point is, Alyssa bought me this shirt years ago to make a point, OK? She's saying that I'm the best dad ever. And then hands down. What t-shirt? I've never bought my dad a t-shirt. You're going to compete with that? You don't make this stuff up. Come on.